much excitement here on talk radio at the moment because um well i frankly i love this couple but i kind of hate them as well because they're so talented when i watch ricky gervais's work i want to act again i'm a failed actor and when i read jane fallon's work i want to write again i'm a failed writer so frankly i should loathe them but i don't because jane fallon joins me live via video link evening to you jane hello how are you my love I'm fine, thank you very much. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. I'm very, very excited to talk to you about your book. Is it wrong I'm more excited to talk to you about Vintage EastEnders from 1993 onwards? Oh, my goodness, yes. I think there was one of mine on <laughs> yes. today. Someone sent me a photo of the credits. Uh, and actually, no, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, last week's one that she was watching oh. on Sky Catch-Up, actually. We're now on to the episodes a little bit later on than that. Sharon Gate has happened now uh, right, in so the Vintage ones. That was well, that, and also... You were there for Frank leaving Pat as well, which was just, again, the heyday era, right? I was Frank leaving Pat and also David Wicks turning up and uh, Bianca meeting him for the first time. Do you remember that? I mean, they were the East Enders glory days. Because what did you do there when you worked there? Uh, well, I started off as the script, um, what was I called? The series script editor. So I kind of oversaw all the script editors and the storylining and stuff. And then I was a producer for the last year I was there. And so... Again, you were overseeing some of the most iconic times of EastEnders. Do you do you miss it at all? Uh, gosh, it's such a long time ago. I mean, it, it, it was really good fun. And I sometimes weirdly have dreams about going back there and they're quite happy dreams. But obviously I then stayed in TV for a long time and did a lot of other stuff. So it does feel like a different lifetime, really. Well, you gave this amazing thread on Twitter about how when you were working at EastEnders and you'd have months of story conferences where you'll have planned, you know, the affairs being exposed and, you know, the death of a poor character, you know, being run over by a bin truck or whatever. And then you'd realise you'd forgotten something. Oh, well, some jobs worse would always, we'd get to the end of the day and we'd been like twisting and turning everything and racking our brains and we'd finally got it all in shape. And then someone would say, but who's looking after Vicky? Yes. And you'd realise you've got Michelle in one story and Pauline in another story and Arthur in another story and Mark in another and Vicky was in another. And you'd have to go through the whole... Because if you didn't sort it out, people would write you letters. The episode would go out and someone would write and say, I'm sorry, but that child's only five years old. Who's looking after that? But they, you know, they still do it today, though. Even in, in every single soap, they'll say, oh, yeah, such and such is at home with the babysitter. They always have to say it. Like, as if... Because if you were meeting somebody in the pub in the... Uh, anyway, if you were meeting a friend, Jane, who had a child, you wouldn't say to that friend, have you got someone looking after your child or are, you, are they left at home on your own? But, but because of what you've just described, that's why there must be so much wasted dialogue in soaps explaining... Yeah, yeah. Left who, in the car outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's ridiculous, but also we would rationale that um, that none of them, the fowlers, could afford babysitters. So you couldn't just say they're with the she's with the babysitter. You'd have to make up some whole. Oh God! Yeah, you know, that is that is absolutely true. God, it's only now you realise, looking back on it again as well, quite how miserable a life poor Pauline had. That's your fault, by the way, Jane Fallon, as well. <laughs> you, you were responsible for that. Now on to happier things, because um, like I, like I said, I know I'm not a massive reader. Do you know why I'm not a huge reader? Is because I I hate the kind of book. And I say this with love where, you know, I hate books where you read it and then you have to go back and read the paragraph again because you're like, what? Hang on. What was going on? Yeah. I love your book because it is just purely readable. Oh, I'm, 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 I've only got to here because I only got it yesterday. So I'm, I'm getting through it. So I'm up to <laughs> chapter. I'm up to chapter seven and a half at the moment. Okay. Um, it's called Queen Bee. I'm absolutely loving it because it's basically just about neighbourhood gossip, right? Yeah, kind of. It's about someone moving into a neighbourhood. She rents a um, what essentially is the staff quarters in a very, very, very posh close of houses because she has to find somewhere to live very quickly when her, her house falls through when she's going through a divorce. And she just comes up against the residents, one of whom is the Queen Bee and is absolutely ghastly. And it's sort of about being a fish out of water in that incredibly weird world of the super rich. And also how just one it's almost like a scab you pick one little nagging insecurity about someone not liking you and how that can then just become absolutely huge right yeah it does but it takes you back to school days doesn't it? it takes you back to all those things that happened where you'd hear you know a little whisper in the playground or something and you would think they were talking about you if you come up against that gang of people and 
you think that one of them is actively trying to turn all the others against you it is actually even as a you know 40 something adult which she is in the book it really gets to you i think well you do like i'm a 40 something adult but even when you sort of hear that someone's done something and you're not being asked along you do i still get that little pang now and then yeah i think we all do we all do we're all basically just big kids with insecurities um and where did you get the idea is it is there a little bit of jane fallon's life in hampstead in in this book uh there might be the odd <laughs> observation of people that i've seen it's a very very you're, you're very strict you're very restrictive about uh, sorry very descriptive about some of the workout tracksuits they're wearing and i just think <laughs> she's seen someone on hampstead wearing that and that's why she's written that i've seen those outfits <laughs> but yeah it's a really specific group of people it's those people who money is everything and there's no joy in it and they they're the kind of people who if you show them something they ask you how much it costs or who the designer is before they can tell you if they like it or not and the they, also and it's like they have no individuality oh totally and they're the people as well that are quaffed to uh, beyond the end of their lives at 7 30 in the morning and you think when when did you get up at 5 a.m to blow dry your hair yes. those people yes. Exactly. And they've all had the same plastic surgery and they've all got the same hair extensions. And, you know, it's weirdly they've sort of just joined another tribe of people. Is, um, are, is Ricky yeah. a fan of your writing? Does he read all your books? Not read a thing. Is he really not? not? No, he doesn't read books. But he's not he even read really yours. No. He keeps saying, oh, I'll wait for the film, but so far there hasn't been. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's in a position to make it, Jane, you know what I mean? I Can't he just say, fine, we'll, we'll film something? I, I am, I, I absolutely love Ricky's comedy. And the thing that I love most about his comedy is that he, on a sixpence, can turn it to making me sob my eyes out five minutes after laughing. Mm. Is he quite soppy at home sometimes? He'll hate you telling me this, by the way. You know that and so do I. But I cannot imagine someone who can write with the heart that he does is always as sort of sarcastic at home he must have his moments where he's a soppy romantic no he's not a romantic he's not always sarcastic but he's not a romantic thank god because i couldn't i couldn't bear it i can't i can't deal with the soppiness really <laughs> I, just, I can't stand it so no he doesn't do all that but obviously he's not you know on all the time and he does have a a very sweet side i love the fact that you would reject it so is he never what's the most romantic thing he's ever done for you Oh, God, I don't know. I can't think of anything. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> so he's a very good present buyer. He's a very thoughtful present buyer. Really? What, is, what, what, what kind of present has he bought you that you've got? Oh, my God, amazing. He knows me so well. Well, just things like he's very good. He'll scour sort of um, uh, vintage shops and find, you know, lovely little bits and pieces. So, you know, like a... a a scruffy old Victorian doll's house, stuff like that, that he knows I really love. But that that's... But that's the thing, though, and it kind of ties in with what you were just saying about how people who've got money, and it's fair to say that probably, you know, you and Ricky are doing all right now, um, mm -hmm. that some people might just go and buy the most expensive thing, or some people mm -hmm. might still say, well, you know what, I'm going to go and buy something that will really mean something to someone, and it might not be the most expensive thing, but it'll exactly. be from the heart. Exactly. I'm a, it just, it's, no, it's no interest to me in someone just going, oh, here's a huge, great big diamond, it costs a fortune, unless it's unless it's an incredibly cool piece of jewellery, but there's no when there's no thought gone into it about your personality or what you like, then I'm really just, uh, just not interested in No, those. oh, God, totally. My my partner once kept a little bit of confetti from a concert we'd been to, oh, and that meant sweet. more to me yes. than the really lovely things he's ever bought me, so I, I kind of get it. So, Queen Bee, it's your latest of eight, right? No, ten. Ten? ten. I thought it was only eight you'd done. And was that, and when you were working sort of in EastEnders and in telly, did that really help you coming up with some of the ideas for the books down the line? I think it helped me in a lot of ways. I think what, the way it really helped me actually, and funny enough, EastEnders in particular, is I'm really conscious of um, cliffhangers. Obviously, if you work on something like a soap, you're obsessed with the cliffhanger and how do you get people to watch, you know, tomorrow or the next day. And so I feel like I've, I've always, I'm looking for that at the end of chapters and twists and turns and how I keep people hooked. That's, yeah, that's a really, I noticed that a few times in the early chapters, because again, as I said, I'm only probably about a quarter of the way through, um, 
that there are a couple of things you've thrown in and i think that that's that's going to come up again later that there are, and that is pure soap right yeah exactly am exactly. i right are, are there I... are there are a few herrings at the start that are going to come back to haunt me a bit later on in the book they were everything will come back and haunt you and i really like just planting those little bombs that you know will explode later on no absolutely and of course the other thing that you produced jane fallon which i just if the eastenders was not enough my dear hello this life did you know that jane produced this life this life i mean that has to be one of the most iconic tv series of all time oh thank you what, what did you do on this life uh yeah i was the producer so um i sort of set it up and uh you know oversaw everything creatively and, and just yeah I, I did you it. did you know when you were filming all of that um, that that it would go on to be so iconic because it was only a couple of series wasn't it but everyone yeah. still talks about it it was only two series but the second series was very long the second series was something like 21 episodes and that's what really embedded it for people I think and like, because the first series did nothing like I was really proud of it we made it on no money and you know it was I think it, it we kind of knew it was different and I, I thought it was great but no one really took any notice at all in the first series and then they recommissioned it because it was so cheap. Like there was no reason for them not to recommission it. <laughs> and because the second series was so long, it gave the people time for the word of mouth to get around. So suddenly halfway through the second series, which was transmitting as we were still filming, it started to get really big and get a momentum. And then everyone went back and rediscovered series one, I think. Because I remember watching it just being a couple of years younger than than the cast in it and, and thinking, well, you know, living in your first house in a shared house and just, it was amazing to watch something that, that had people that spoke in the same way you did and, and faced the same problems in the same way you did. Uh, and no one, I don't think, had written in those voices before. Yeah, we had a fantastic bunch of writers, obviously Amy Jenkins, who uh, kicked it off and, and created it. But then we had also had another, I don't know, probably 12 or 15 writers across the whole thing who were all just great and mostly young, new writers, you know, with sort of interesting voices. Well, it shows, and it shows as well in your work. So Queen Bee, it's out now. Um, mm -hmm. It tells the story, as I've said, of... Um, well, her name's Laura. She's the one that's moved into this new new sort of yeah. cul-de-sac in Hampstead. Um, is this the last one? Have you got a few more in you, Jane? Oh, God, no, I'm going... I'm, you'll never stop me. I'm going on forever. This is my plan, is to do this for ever and ever. I'm halfway through the next one. Has lockdown helped you with your writing? Uh, it's not been that much different for me, weirdly. I found it a bit hard the first few weeks. I think everyone did. It was didn't quite know what was going on in the world. And now I'm just back in my normal groove. It's a bit harder because we're both at home all day now. And I just like silence in the house. So <laughs> yeah. it's got a bit more. I spend quite a lot of time going, shush. Are you, but, are you, um, are you saying that living with Ricky Gervais isn't always quiet? He's just sometimes a bit like a Fisher Price toy that just, you know, it just kind of makes noises all the time. So, yeah, that can be a bit. Shove him in the <laughs> shove him in the attic with the other Fisher Price toys. No one will notice. Jane Fallon, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I can't wait to tweet you when I finish this to yes, to, to tell you the ending and and what I think of it. And I can't wait to to absolutely digest it. So thank you, Jane Fallon. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's the author, Jane Fallon. And I told you I was more excited about EastEnders than anything else. And I think she got that.